And then, of course, I'll preach. But again, I hope and pray that you'll be here for that. Any other announcements that I may have missed? Preacher, I just want everyone to know that I finally got the Lottie Moon offering envelope. They're in all the pews. Um, it goes to the end of this month. It's for international missions. <coughs> assure you now that a lot of people think well there's a lot of churches that will be giving you might be surprised that the churches a lot of times even their own members are not supporting the church they go to they'll support a ministry on television or something else and so we begin to be a self interest cry, uh, type of folks that comes down and we need to be united in what we're giving God holds us accountable for all that we put our money towards. So understand that whatever you're giving it to, and I'm not asking you for the church, I'm just making sure you understand that if you're here, then you're giving to the Lord. Not to the church, you're giving to the Lord. To further it along. And so it is with missions. You ought to make sure, because let me tell you this, in China, there's over 3 million Christians. And the Lottie Moon has been a tremendous part of the people in China coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord. And so I can tell you that a communist country that does not care for God, they have a no vacancy sign hung out. We need to make sure that we're supporting missions that brings others to know Jesus Christ. And I hope and pray that you'll do that. It's all about the Lord. All right. Any other announcements I may have missed? Get your hymn books again and turn to number 91. 91. Verse Noel.
sins. And Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come into your house. And be blessed each one that's come your way. Indeed, Lord, for those that's not here, whatever the reason may be, Lord, touch them in a mighty way. Let them know we're praying for them. Now, Heavenly Father, take this offering which we're about to receive. For to use it in thy will. For this, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
the whole of the world. Amen. Um, we were, don't normally have two. Your preacher asked when I was going to do Mary, did you know? And it just so happened I brought it today because I didn't know whether Jess would be up to see me. And so I always try to come prepared. <laughs> This past week, I've had some sick church members. I'm grateful that God answered our prayers for Miss Jessica. Amen. She had a hard time with her blood pressure, and I thank God that he's heard our prayers, lifting her up in prayer continuously, because I know without a doubt that I suffer from the same thing that she had to go to the hospital for, and many of you do in here. But when it hits you the first time, it seems like it hits you the hardest with your blood pressure elevating. I'm just grateful to the Lord that he's taken care of that. Amen. I didn't take this time for announcements, but I did want to recognize that uh, I asked you to be in prayer for Jenny. I took her to nuclear medicine this past week. 
and they think that she may have to have her gallbladder taken out. I'm going to see the surgeon, taking her to see the surgeon in the morning, and uh, he'll let us know. There's no gallstones, but Brother George sort of had the same thing. It's an inflated gallbladder, and that sometimes is the worst kind, and very, very dangerous. So up part of the night each night with her throwing up, and... She sometimes just the water. Then there's times she can eat. And then there's times she just cannot. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into detail. But I went for my other injection this week. Got bad news. I'm not going to take God's time to tell you what it is. But I just want to let you know that I cherish your prayers. And I praise you for that. Find Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. In the fall of 1775, a manager of Baltimore's greatest hotel <laughs> refused lodging to a dirty farmer. And that farmer, that manager, thought that his lowly appearance would bring disgrace to his hotel. So he didn't let him in. Now that man left and found another place. And then shortly thereafter, they told him who it was. It was the vice president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. And he had gotten him another room and that manager found it out. He was quick to send a messenger to say, come, we gonna just, we'll take care of the room. Everything's fine. And he said, if you would not allow a dirty American farmer to stay in your hotel, then it's too good for the vice president of the United States to stay in it also. True story. In much the same way, our Lord Jesus came into this world. There was no room for him in the end. After more than 2,000 years, nothing's changed. In the United States of America, some of our Christians are still calling themselves Christians, but they're on another ship. They're on the ship of the world. The world ship now is more to them than the Son of God. There's a no vacancy sign out except on Sunday. There's a no vacancy sign out unless it's around Christian people. But the world has become so important to the Christian that I can tell you that God says, He who loves the world cannot love me. We are now, as you've heard me mention in the last two messages, I mention it again, the devil has made sure that we have something going on in our life. The monetary things of Christmas. We're more involved in getting Christmas gifts. We're more involved in everything that we're doing, but it has nothing to do with the Savior. So when you begin to look at the innkeeper, I thank God that he didn't put his name down there. It might have been your name. And I can assure you, plain simple, we have a lot of people that have that no vacancy sign out for Christ in this important day. I don't mind telling you. As I prepared this message, the Lord, the Holy Spirit speaking to me said, plain as say, our Lord came to a world of filth. And the United States of America is a cloned society of filth. We have a lot of people that proclaim Jesus Christ with their lips, but their heart is far from it. Do you know why? They despise somebody in their family they wouldn't forgive. They despise 
hearing the word of God preached, they become criticizers. They become hate mongers. And Christ speaks about that. He says, there's no room in that heart for me as long as you are criticizing my brother or my sister in Christ. Why? I got news for you. You can find a lot of fault with me. But be careful. I might can find a lot of fault with you. But the matter is, I love you just the same. And I'm not saying it with my lips and not with my heart. I say it with my heart. But some say they love you with their lips. But they do not love you with their heart. Now listen. Christ said many will say the same thing about me. They will say, I love Jesus. But their heart says differently. How can that be? Well, just search your own soul. Do you have the right to judge another person? Do you have a right to criticize somebody else? Have you taken care that you're so perfect that you can criticize someone else? How perfect are you? Shamefully, God says, they will be. And in all of this, God is speaking to us that over 2,000 years ago, there was no vacancy signs that was put out in that end in Bethlehem. I think of the old hymn, I wrote it down, No Room in the Inn. It says, no beautiful chamber, no soft bed, no place but a manger, nowhere for his head. No praises of gladness, no thought of their sin, no story, no glory but sadness, no room in the inn. No one to receive him, no welcome while there, no balm to relieve him, no staff but a spear, no seeking his treasure, no weeping for sin, no doing his pleasure, no room in the inn. No room, no room for Jesus. Oh, give him welcome free, lest you should hear at heaven's gate, there's no room for thee. I can assure you, last week I told you why we celebrate Christmas on the December the 25th. And another reason I really don't believe December the 25th is the day of our Lord was born is it would have been winter time and our shepherds is understandably has a pattern. When the weather got cold, they'd put the sheep in caves to protect them from the cold winter wind. That cold winter wind came across and would cut right through the shepherds and the sheep. Many had died. So they learned that in the wintertime, they would put the sheep in the caves. As the sun came out and the day was nice, they would take the sheep out, but only in the daytime. If you read the Christmas story, you listen to the scriptures, it's nighttime. It's nighttime. In what we call the winter time. One of my folks that will be listening to this message today, Richard Bradley down in Australia, he has a group, they get together and they listen to the message. I think it's just an encouragement like I can't believe. But he sent me some pictures and I know that he's a dog lover, so all you dog lovers remember this. He was out in the yard playing with his dog on the green grass. I had always heard that when it's wintertime here, it's summertime in Australia. And so that pretty much proves it. But I was grateful that he sent me that picture. Today I want to share some calendar news. Around A.D. 532, a calendar was set up sort of like something like ours. Now you might be saying, Preacher, why do you tell us this? <coughs> in Bible, <coughs> in our scriptures, numbers are very important. And so a lot of times, just like December the 25th, I told you that that was 
goes all the way back to 336 A.D. And what was that? That was when the Roman church declared that Jesus was conceived and Jesus was crucified on the same day. And nine months later, December the 25th, was when he was born. So that's how then they started that we set aside December the 25th as the date we celebrate Christmas. But let me share something with you here. It was set up, this calendar, in uh, 532 A.D. It was set up pretty much like ours. But they had made a mistake. And that's why we have a leap year every four years. Now let me explain. In 1752... The calendar was jumped ahead 11 days. Now just think about this. You're preparing the cantata. Today's what? The 10th. But what if they decided that we're not going to have anything, so they're going to bump the calendar up 11 days. So today would be December the 21st. When we celebrate George Washington's birthday, it was February 22nd. He was actually born February 11th because they moved the calendar up 11 days in 1752. Did you know that? Say amen. amen. Who, who said amen? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. So a lot of times you have to see that these dates have been changed and these dates are, are the decision of men. But God's timing is always perfect. I couldn't help but think about Mary and she's pregnant. She's ready to have a baby. And here she comes riding on this donkey. And do you know it was traveling a great long distance? And do you know something? That donkey didn't stumble one time. I can just imagine and I've been reading in my Bible. I've been studying Jephthah. I've been reading in, in, uh, in those particular books. And I thought about Jessica and Brett. Because one man had 30 sons and 30 daughters. I could use more sons. Did you hear that? 30 sons and 30 daughters. And, and so when you begin to see these things and you listen. But then over here is old Jephthah. He has one daughter. Now let me say this to you. And God has one son. And he is the only way to heaven. Amen. Nothing that you can do. Nothing that you can say. Nothing that you can provide with your mouth. Unless you're confessing that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the son of the living God. That he died. And rose again the third day to pay my sin debt in full. Now this baby had no place to lay his head. Did you know when Christ was on his mission and he was in his ministry and those three years, did you know that he had no place to lay his head? Nowhere. He didn't have a place that let's just meet down at Ridgeview Baptist Church. He didn't say that. He didn't say to go meet anywhere. They slept openly. They would sleep in, in borrowed places. If you'll notice something, Jesus never owned anything but mine and your sin. Just mine and your sin. And here we are. Today in verse 7, in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, I, want to, I built my message around there was no room for them in the end. First, there's no room historically. Verse 11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. <coughs> historically, prophecy was fulfilled. Well, what is it meaning there? It's meaning that the Davidic line, he said that, it will come out of the loins of David. Well, 
Joseph and Mary both are of the lineage of David. So they came to Bethlehem. But did you know something? There was not one person, not one of David's lineage living in Bethlehem. Not one. As a matter of fact, they had gone from being kings and officers and full authority in Israel to being nothing mere but peasants. Laboring. Until the coming of the son. And he owns nothing. That's why it says he comes lowly. Riding a donkey. And do you know something? He didn't even own that donkey. He owned nothing. But I can tell you one thing he owns today. My soul. My heart. Regardless of what others may think. Verse 3. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea and to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and the lineage of David. 700 years earlier, the prophet Micah had prophesied in Micah 5 2, but thou Bethlehem Eptra. Now, why did he call Bethlehem? Ephtra, because there was no, there was two Bethlehems. And when Micah decided 700 years ago by the word of God, the inspiration of God, and he says, Micah, <coughs> I want you to announce the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the northern kingdom, at the same time, Isaiah was saying unto us, a son is born. Look again, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So there could not be anybody that does not know who he is. And the same applies in America today. That every single one of us, just like the entire nation of Israel, knew that there was a son coming, the son of God, the Messiah. One's in the north and one's in the south announcing the same thing. One didn't know what the other one was saying, but the Holy Spirit of God was directing that path. Well, preacher, I don't know what you're talking about today. 700 years before the coming of the Lord, Isaiah and Micah talked about the coming of the Lord. Even talked about <laughs> in Isaiah what what he was going to do. He'd be riding a, a borrowed donkey. Can you imagine historically how perfect that is in the word of God? Do you know how perfect the word of God is? 700 years down the road and everything was perfect of what the prophet had predicted. Well, you've got to understand. You say, boy, he was really smart. Well, it was not him. It was God speaking through the Holy Ghost. Now listen, that same Holy Ghost is here today. And He knows your heart. And whether your heart has Jesus or not, or whether you got a no vacancy sign out because you don't want Him. So what are we going to do? How are we going to react to this Christmas? How are we going to react to the historical Christ? 700 years before he was prophesied how he would come in every detail. Boy, I tell you what, if you stop and sit back and think about that, man, I, guess I just sit there and just, God, you're just perfect. God, you, you're just perfect. You know, Every single thing that has taken place in this scripture was perfect. Now you read it and you're going to be upset with things. 
You're going to say, well, if I was God, I'd change this. I'd change that. There's some pretty bad things in here. But it was for the will of God. You know, I say this, <clears throat> not to beat the drum, <clears throat> but my doctor says, will you take chemo? Will you please, please, please take chemo? And I said, no. He said, it'll prolong your life. And I broke out laughing. I said, you kidding me? You telling me that I can take a pill and it'll override what God's given me? Can that pill give me life? If it, if it can give me life, then I'd like to take it home and plant a tree and pour it on that tree so I can see it before I die. In other words, it's going to grow quick, right? Pastor, you're so hard-headed. I said, yeah, I am. Why? Is it a sin for me to have the belief of God in my heart? But don't you know that God has given this medication that it might prolong your life? I do. If you'll come tell me one person that's took chemo is still alive a few years after they've taken it. And you can't. Historically, Micah had been the sounding board. He said, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. Now this is God. Listen to God. He said, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. In other words, he didn't start in Bethlehem. God the Father is speaking these words, and he said that he's going to come forth unto me in Bethlehem. This is God the Father will be right there present at his birth. Did you know he was present for the crucifixion? He's been with Jesus every step of the way. When they beat him, they was beating the Father also. How do you know, preacher? Jesus said, if you've done these things unto me, you've done it unto the one who sent me. We, as a nation, have hung out the no vacancy sign. And have said, we don't need you. Leave. We don't want you. We'll take the monetary things of Christmas. You know, speaking about how all these things come so perfectly timed, God rules and overrules the things of man, the affairs of men. Uh, you might be planning them. I'll never forget the words of my 19-year-old son the last time I spoke with him before he died. He said, I love you, Daddy. My other son, before he died, I love you, Daddy. Daddy's a word I don't hear no more. And that breaks my heart. But he says, I love you, Daddy. And I said, I love you too, son. I'll see you on Monday. He died on Sunday. Don't make plans. Here was a 6'4", 220 pound muscle bound kid with a heart of gold. He could pick his daddy up. Daddy, I love you. And I said, I love you too. 
I will see you on Monday. I saw him on Sunday after he had been shot in the head and he had died. God said, don't make no plans unless you include me. We have a lot of people that make plans and they're going to have a plan for Christmas and family and somebody's going to say, I'm not going to invite Joe. Let's don't invite Joe. Everybody agree it's okay. Let's not invite Joe. And then they go and say, oh, we had such a Christian time. We had a family time. Listen to me very carefully. You mock God when you do things out of spite. You are a mocker of God. And all those who join you are mockers of the holy God. And we have that. You know, the place was full. Have you ever wondered why there was no room for him in the end? Does anybody have any idea? Say amen. Listen to me. You know your pastor does research and I sift it and look at it and go and this and that. Well, let me tell you why God didn't allow him to be born in that end. You see this room? This was an end. George, you got five feet over there. Jim, you got five feet down here. Kay, you got four feet here. Joe, you got... In other words, it was divided up and there was nothing private. Nothing private. Now, I'm going to ask you women. How many of you would like to have had your baby publicly... God knew what it was at and God knew what he needed to do. So he made a place where nobody wanted to be. Nobody wanted to be in that stable. They wanted to be in that inn. It was a cold night. There they were. God says, my son will be born by invitation only. He tells the shepherds to come. Now they didn't see the birth. They seen the baby after the birth. And then of course the postcards say, well and there's the wise men. The wise men didn't come till Jesus was almost two years old living in a house. All of these things was perfect. I know you never wonder what I'm thinking. But I like to read the Bible and meditate. And sometimes I go to thinking about things that's not in it. And one of the things I couldn't get off my mind. Lord. Were the shepherds at the crucifixion? Lord. You don't tell us who that innkeeper is but. Did he find out later that it was Jesus he didn't have room for? I don't think he did until he died. Lord, was that innkeeper at the crucifixion? Did he see, did he see the Son of God crucified? I wonder how many people went to that crucifixion to satisfy their hate. For the Messiah. I wonder how many come to church with that same hate in their heart. I wonder how many people this Christmas is going to have a family get together, and in that family get together, there's hatefulness and hate. I'm going to remind you you'll <laughs> mock God. No, I'm going to satisfy myself. That's because you're ashamed of God. 
Oh no, I'll, I'll tell everybody about God. Not the God of the Bible. Not this God. No vacancy. No vacancy whatsoever. And then there was no room symbolically. A society with no room for Jesus. You know, I couldn't help but think about it. Does anybody in here know anything about the Washington Monument? Now listen before I ask you a question. I want you to say amen. Does anybody know anything? Have you ever been to Washington? How many have been to Washington? Raise your hand. Okay. How many have you been to the Washington Monument? Do you know what's on top of the Washington Monument? You know the words, Bo? You listen to this very carefully. How tall is it? Did you get it? 555 feet. Do you know how far you can see at 555 feet in Washington? 69 square miles. That's what they've done. I, I want to read you about this because it's very important. On top of there are two Latin words called Los Deo. You can't see them, but they're up there. Do you know what they mean? Praise be to God. I'm surprised the ACLU and uh, Muslim community have met, have never asked it, okay, then we're going to put Allah up there also. And the ACLU will say, take them all down, take them all down. So you have to see here, that if you go up, it's 898 steps and 50 landings. As one climbs the steps, now I wrote this down. On the 20th landing is a memorial presented by some Chinese Christians. Presumably Lottie Moon's people. On the 24th is a presentation made by Sunday school children from New York and Philadelphia. Quoting Proverbs 10, 7, Luke 18, 6, Proverbs 22, 6. When the cornerstone was laid on July the 4th, 1848, deposited within it were many items, including a Bible presented by the Bible Society. The Washington Monument is but one structure in our nation's capital that reflects our thoughts of God. And yet, they don't worship God. They don't get their information in how to rule from God. But do you know something? How many of you get up every morning and ask God to guide you? How many of you get up every morning and say, Lord, I am blind as a bat. Because I cannot see what all is going to go in my direction today. Guide my steps. Direct to me. Direct my paths. And you know what? God does that. But you must ask Him. Just like the leaders of this nation need to be asking directions in what they need to do. Now they, they're fiddle-footing around with Supporting Israel. I was reading in Judges. And it said there's going to come a time. I've had people. Now I stopped right in the middle of that. That's not right. Yes it is. Listen. I've had people say. What's going to happen to the United States? What's going to happen to this country? I don't see it in Scripture. Oh, well, let me tell you what God the Father says. I will remove every nation that supports Israel. Wait a minute. We're not so supposed to support Israel? Yeah. Yeah, and we're supposed to come to church. But you got to understand 
what God is doing. You beginning to see what God said he'd do. He's going to bring every nation on the face of the earth against Israel. <coughs> and he is making sure that they don't have the United States to lean on. They have to make sure that they don't have Australia to lean on. They have to make sure that they don't have other nations that they can lean on. God is going to make sure they have nothing to lean on but Him. That's the only way they're going to confess. He, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. And that will be Jesus. Understand that we have to be a part. And you know, I'd be kicking and screaming, saying, well, I hope God don't do that. I can tell you now, what are you doing when I tell you to pray the peace of Jerusalem? Well, I told you a couple of Sundays ago, you remember what it was? Every prayer we should pray is for the peace of Jerusalem. You say, well, I don't understand. When we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we're saying, come Lord Jesus. Because the Prince of Peace is Jesus Christ. When you're praying for the peace of Jerusalem, you're praying to a holy God, come Lord Jesus. Are you ready for Him to come? What will happen to you if you have not received Jesus Christ? What kind of heart do you have right now if He took you home right now? You say, well, I've already been told by many preachers. Hey, there ain't no preacher going to save you. Well, I, I don't care. I've done all. I don't care what you've done. One. Let me be so vague as to say, there's going to be preachers that go to hell. There's going to be tons of church members that go to hell. Because they truly didn't believe Jesus. They had a heart that was ugly to God. Mocking God. Judging other people. Taking the place of God. Wanting to do great things to steal the glory of God. God says all the glory belongs to me. But we got a lot of people that want to look good in church. They want to hold the highest places. They want to do a lot of things. But do you know something? They're going to stand before a holy God and give an account. And the Lord said that many will come in my name and preside what? Lord, Lord. And they will not enter the kingdom of God. This sweet little baby has come for a reason that you and I might have life and have it abundantly. I think of the words of John Jay. He was one of the framers of the Constitution. It's on the Constitution. You'll see his name if you look for it. But he was appointed by George Washington to be the first Supreme Justice. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. In a letter to clergyman, Jedediah Morse wrote, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. And it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select, now get this, and prefer Christians for our rulers. That's, that's in the law. You can't be a ruler of this nation unless you're a Christian. Well, we've got Muslims in Washington. You have to be a Christian to be an officer in the church, but we've got devils that's officers in the church. Satan's here today. Not him, but you can count on one of his cronies high powered cronies to do you one thing to stop you from hearing the word of God 
We don't have Christian leaders. Not in government and not in our churches. And God will deal with them. You must see that and understand that. You know, I want to close right quick, but I wanted to go over. There was a Michael Newdow. Uh, he, he had mentioned something, had become nationally recognized for his efforts to remove any mention of God uh, in our national life. Now, let me read you something. It says, the man who defines the word supernatural as an oxymoron is an emergency room doctor, lawyer, and a licensed minister of atheism of the First Amendment Church of True Science has put forth efforts to remove the words under God from the Pride of Allegiance. He fought to prevent presidents from being able to lay their hand on the Bible <coughs> when they're sworn in. He wants in God we trust removed from our currency. And he stopped to practice chaplains in the U.S. Congress because they're open and in prayer. <laughs> And I think it's ironic that on the day Newdow argued his case before the Supreme Court and he was there to say, I want you to remove under God through all these things and from the Pledge of Allegiance especially, the first words he heard the Supreme Court say, God save the United States and this honorable court. <laughs> You think that didn't hit him like a ball bat between the eyes? He's in there to tell him we can't do this. And all those Supreme Court justices are saying the very thing. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Our society has room for the world. But it has a no vacancy for Jesus. When I think of Michael Newdow, I'm mindful that he is nothing more than a clone of our society. Listen to me and I close, I promise. How in the world can anybody, there's not a person I talk to that wouldn't stand up for Jesus. Only problem is they won't. Oh, they'll stand up here in church. Oh, they'll stand up at a dinner get together. Oh, they'll, they'll come over and <laughs> sing a song with Scott. And... But truth of the matter, we care more about conversations of the world than we do of God. We will open our papers to see what's on sale for Christmas. But we won't open up our Bibles for the one that God sent that will save your soul eternally. So you see that fellow that wants all those things taken away? I agree. You know why? We're playing the hypocrite. Because we love more things of the world than anything of God. So what do we do? It's not a confession of your lips. It's a confession of your heart. My cancer doctor said probably this is your last Christmas. Christmas. So I know that I'm going to stand before my Lord. And when I stand there, He's going to look right here. And He's going to see is Leroy Mobley sitting on the throne of His heart because 
I want things my way. Or is Jesus sitting here that says, hate me, but I still love you. Do me wrong, yet I'll forgive you. I can't do that. I'm a sinful person. So God made sure I was born again. Now, I've got a new heart. But I've also got the old one. And the new heart came from heaven, not a denomination. I can only receive the new birth from the Father when the Father knows that I mean it. And do you know what happens? Right here. He's going to look in there. And he's going to say, be cast into outer darkness. Or he's going to say, welcome home, my son. Now that's not no guarantee that this doctor is wrong. <coughs> There's no guarantee tomorrow. The rest of the day. So I'm going to close with this right quick. If you truly died today, God's going to look in that heart. And if Christ ain't there, you're going to hell. And there ain't no change in it once you die. What will you do with Jesus? One of the hardest things I've done is God sent me to a place that I didn't want to go. And I repented among a bunch of people that I wouldn't even let them see me smoke a cigarette. Not being a hypocrite, I just hated them. But that's where God sent me. These snooty tooties guess what? I was sitting about where Mark is. And I got out and I come and let me tell you something. When I came, I didn't know anybody was there but Jesus. Right. Amen. So if you're here today and the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and you don't come because of somebody here you ain't getting saved no way. Because the Father's going to look in your heart and guess what? He's going to see you're not, you're, you're afraid, you're ashamed, you're embarrassed. Not me, brother. I strutted right down there and the first thing that my pastor asked me, he says, Leroy, what do you want? I said, I've already got him and that's Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, holy God, I love you. And something turned loose. And it exited. I sit here and it exited through those windows. Now those windows, when I was a little boy, I seen Jesus knocking on that door. Holman Hunt painted that picture. And he had his friends to come and they looked at that picture. And they said, oh, it's beautiful. Oh, Christ has a beautiful face and... And the thorns that's hanging there. But, but you messed up. There's no doorknob on this side. He said no because it's on the inside. You have to be the one to let Christ in. He is not going to force His way into you. But if you die without Him, He is going to send you to a misery that never ends. Never ends. Up here, we're so used to time. And time has a factor of changing and changing. <laughs> Eternity is not going to change. You will be there forever and ever and ever and ever. And you'll be hurting as if the first moment from 10,000 million years ago. 
Because <coughs> Jesus, you never received him. You left a no vacancy sign out. And if you are a person like that today, and you don't come, not because of me. I can't save you. I couldn't save myself. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today, you need to come. And I hope and pray you will. Stand please as Scott directs us in our invitational hymn. Number 200. Jesus, our loving Lord and Savior. Amen.